So hey everyone, it's Madison from your diversity class and for my Panopto I'm doing chapter 6 and the title of chapter 6 is Responsive Academic Lang Language Instruction and this chapter is found in our book on page 113 through 135. So just a little introduction to chapter six is the main takeaway from this chapter is following the CLR approach and methods toward a non-standard language and make sure you have a belief system that supports different languages and also helps structure academic activities around that. And then number two would be to adapt to a responsive academic teaching routine to help students move from home language to academic language. So language is controversial and the validation of non-standard languages or what the author likes to refer to as an unaccepted language remains one of the most controversial subjects. And this subject is controversial because language is one of the most critical aspects of a person's heritage and culture. And with that being said, some people can have hypersensitivity. So the, like, the author says, which is also referred to as offensive towards this subject. So an educator needs to be, um, needs to have background knowledge about language and pay attention for language ignorance, misinformation, and negative beliefs. So following the CLR method, educators need to accomplish three objectives. And so this knowledge is meant to undo the damage of past institutional linguistic racism and ignorance about unaccepted languages and just language in general. Language deficit is a term that is defined as the perspective commonly held about home languages of, of students who have been identified as most likely to be underdeserved. And CLR is designed to overcome these barriers that these pers um, perspectives present. And there are three main objectives, and those three objectives are number one, to recognize the linguistic rules of the non-standard languages. Number two, giving your students enough opportunities for code switching. And then number three would be infusing writing activities into your everyday teaching routines. And these are three main objectives that educators need to accomplish to be a responsive teacher. So just continuing with the CLR method, um, while you're achieving these three objectives, an educator must be aware of certain terminology that is unacceptable for a CLR approach. And unacceptable um, terminology for a CLR educator would be words and terms like fix it, make it better, wrong, and correct it. There's just better ways to word it and phrase this and just different terminology that an educator could use to use the CLR approach. And these words could be considered language deficient and should be replaced with different, more positive terminology. So acceptable terminology should be replaced with positive affirming phrases and just using terminology that is acceptable for a CLR approach. So that would include phrases like translate, put another way, can you switch it, give an academic lang language, give in school language, and then I just have a little video that kind of represents this. So in other videos that I've done, I've brought up a lot of uh, times where where you should bring up feedback, where is it most effective, but 
even if you, you know, followed all of my advice, you still could be giving feedback the wrong way. Let me give you an example. So let's say you are uh, having students complete a project for you. They're supposed to put from scratch together a birdhouse. And this is the birdhouse that you get from one of the students. And, you know, we're looking at it, it's, there's, I mean, lots and lots of issues with this birdhouse. You know, the colors are all off to what you suggested. The painting is terrible. It's not weatherproofing the, the wood. Uh, the, the roof is crooked. And the hole uh, for the birdhouse is way too big, so that means the squirrels will get inside, you know, tons of details. So what you could do is basically just, I mean, tear this thing apart. Just judge it, right? You could just judge it. And that's the one thing you really want to move away from when you're giving feedback is judging. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, when I went to university, I got this feedback on, on a lot of my projects. Confusing. Misdirecting. But what does that mean? You have to give people, you don't, don't pass judgment. You're, what you're there to do is to improve the quality um, of that product. So, if I gave all the feedback uh, about this particular uh, project to the student, it would be very hard for them to distinguish, especially for a novice, which parts they should actually focus on. Well, really, the most important part here is maybe making it structurally sound. So that's the first thing I might tackle with the student, and that's the first piece of advice and feedback and instruction that I might, I might give them. What I'm asking you to do is that when you're determining what your assessment and feedback goals are, you have to think about if, if the student walks away with one thing, uh, and they're able to do that thing well. What is that one thing? Well, I know that if I give feedback about the, the structure of the house, and first that the first thing I want to do is not have the student learn how to paint the colors right in a, on a, a rooftop of a, of a birdhouse, but I want them to be, for it to be structurally, um, you know, uh, stable, then that's what I focus on in my first feedback. We tend to overwhelm um, our learners with, with everything. And then they never actually, they don't have the experience to be able to step back and see, you know, look at all these grammar and punctuation errors, I'm going to fix them now instead of, did I actually build a good, uh, a good argument in this thesis? So what's most important? It doesn't mean that the things that you're commenting on are more important than others, but in order for us to get to a level of mastery with anything, we have to start somewhere. And you have to think about what are the most important aspects and uh, qualities and skills to build before we can get there. That's why I think the other thing, uh, after talking about essentials, is resubmission. We don't offer that enough. So providing feedback is one thing, but are you giving people opportunity to integrate that feedback that they received to produce a better product? Imagine this birdhouse. I mean, I, I, I've had so many projects even at school as a little kid where you hand it in and you get to feel bad about that birdhouse you made for the rest of your life because nobody ever gave you a chance to go back and try it again. Give them a chance to take the feedback that you've given them and incorporate it and build on that, on those skills that they already have because, I mean, this shows some skill. I mean, it kind of looks like a birdhouse, right? So give that opportunity for them to integrate that, uh, that feedback from you, the expertise, but make it focused so that they can walk away knowing exactly what they need to do. They don't have to dig through all of the feedback you've given them. They can move on to that in the next part. In this video, I was trying to demonstrate how you can get from a not-so-good birdhouse to an awesome birdhouse for little birdies. I hope this helped you. Um, seriously, I was talking about feedback. I am expecting some people in the comments, please, also, if you enjoy this video, give it a thumbs up. I think it's down there. Favorite it if it's your favorite and you have a YouTube channel. If you don't, you should start one up. And subscribe is up there. And like I said, I'm looking for feedback. I'm also looking for some comments and ideas. Please post them in the space below and I'll talk to you next time. All right, so let's go to the next one. So, non-standard language support. To be able to offer support to students with non-standard languages, 
Educators need to understand the history of and also the present day context of linguistic policies. We need to um, recognize that students coming from these background, backgrounds often possess two or more languages that they use at home. And often these students are penalized for having a language variety that is different than the common linguistic makeup of the school. And a student's poor performance should not always be attributed to the grammatical and phonological characteristics of the non-standard language. Education policy is lacking in support for non-standard languages. And I think the most important thing to remember is that any language policy that excludes support for non-standard languages creates a contradiction for non-standard language users and the teachers who teach them. So we need to pay attention to the policies and advocate for supporting students with different linguistic makeups. And I also have another video to support that. Education Absolutely. and so forth. 
So if we want to give them that opportunity, we've got to make it the focus of our classrooms. We have to make it, it is up to us to teach academic language. We can use their social English as a foundation, as a resource, as a tool to develop that academic language. But as teachers, our primary focus must be academic language. All right, so moving on, most people view different languages or non-standard languages as dialects, and research on these languages have been a debate for decades, creating a limited perspective on the matter. The history may be up for debate, but the different views are very clear, and they can be divided into four different categories. We will discuss two categories more than the others, and those two our ethno-linguistic perspective and the dialect perspective because these views are more aligned with the validation and affirmation of home languages. While the dialect view is most used by educators, the creolist perspective offers a worldwide view while the deficit perspective is seen as, as a racist view today. The four broad linguistic categories are, we'll start with number one, etho, ethno-linguistic perspective. This view is that unaccepted languages are rooted in the social, historical, and linguistic development of the people and any understanding of the language depends on those factors. This perspective has the greatest potential for impact because it calls for the educator to is explicitly acknowledge and affirm the home language as a means to achieving standard American English proficiency. The second one, the Creolist perspective, is similar to the ethno-linguistic perspective, but it does not necessarily attribute to the grammatical base to the indigenous language. They see it as more as something that materializes over a few generations and it's solidified into a linguistic identity. The third one, the dialect perspective, represents another form of language responsiveness. Dialects are often identified on the basis of the systematic existence of particular linguistic features among groups of people. So this can be defined as a dialect of a variety that is spoken because one belongs to our particular region, social class, age, group, or any other relevant grouping. And number four, the deficit perspective. This belief holds the view that non-standard languages are nothing but bad improper English. And the speakers of those non-standard languages are incapable of comprehending and understanding um, standard English. So today this view is seen as a, a racist view and belief, and it was believed by many Americans and held by most of them up until about the 1940s. So linguistic absolutes. There are three linguistic absolutes, and number one is all language is good meaning that language is not bad, improper, wrong, or correct, and there's no such thing as a bad language. And number two, all linguistic forms are rule governed and patterned. And these linguistic forms are not made up, they're not randomized or created for no purpose. The range of the rules covers all of the dimensions of language, including phonics, morphemes, syntax, um, semantics, pragmatics, and discourse. And each of these dimensions stated have their own set of rules, which only points out the depths of the linguistic forms and rules. So number three is we acquire the language that is spoken by the primary caregivers at home. And so this begins at pre-birth and continues up until about pre-kindergarten. And the language the student speaks at home will be the one the student uses at school. That student comes to school with all those language rules already intact. 
and most importantly, with a positive view of that home language. But in some cases, that positive view of their home language can be damaged by the student being told that the way that their family speaks, like their parents, their grandparents, or their siblings, the way that they speak is wrong. So as CLR educators, we need to make sure that we're positive about their home language and keep their positive view about their heritage. So the non-standard language rules, there are about three. And number one is understand that standard English may have a certain usage or structure as a rule, but not all languages have that as a rule. So not all languages have the same structures and rules that English does, and we just need to keep that in mind. Number two, understand the derivation of the rule in the context of the indigenous language. And then number three is to understand how to translate home language to the intended target language. And that's something we as educators are gonna need to work on specific to those that student's home language. So besides just understanding the language rules, we need to be aware of the practices because just understanding the CLR method isn't enough. We need to understand how to implement that into real life situations in the classroom. And we, know, we need to know how to validate and affirm our students' home languages. We need to think of ways to help students build the necessary skills to switch languages. This can be easier for older children to understand appropriate language for certain situations. But for younger children, they need to learn when it is appropriate to use their home language or their school language. For awareness, pay attention to the languages used by students. Different language rules apply to the different language background and cultures. This knowledge ensures that teachers will not react negatively when a student uses their home language. These steps help build the bridge between the language used at home and also the academic lang language used at school and views of non-standard languages. Many students lack the necessary skills to learn how to switch from home language to academic language, which falls on the student by failure of the school. So we as educators, we need to help build these skills to switch the languages. And especially our non-standard English speaking students, we need to figure out different ways to teach them how to code switch. CLR instruction help students learn how to code switch, which brings us up to our next topic. But first, let's watch this video that goes along with it. is that you are surrounded in the language. You're not teaching the language independent from actual content or real life situation. I think a lot of people in our country have had high school language and it's a textbook, a reading and writing kind of thing, but immersion means you're in a situation where you have to Pay attention to the language in order to be able to do the activity that's going on. Okay. 
just through routine and copying the teacher, they start developing uh, song vocabulary and other things like that that are part of their real kindergarten world. First day, it's like what's going on, and then after that, it's, well, this is the way school is. The teacher speaks in a new language, and I try to figure it out. They're able to use language in all the things they do in school. When they're washing their hands, when they're drawing on paper, when they're trying to work out a problem with a friend, um, any of these situations can be situations in which we can insert language and, and practice language. They don't even realize how special it is. In Richmond Elementary School's Japanese Language Magnet Program, students follow the Oregon State Curriculum. They study their core subjects in Japanese for half the day and English for the other half. In middle school, they use Japanese for a third of their day and in high school, Japanese is offered as an advanced language class. <laughs> Michael Bacon, who has been teaching in the program for more than a decade, sees students benefiting in many ways. Their performance in sort of cognitive assessments um, are higher. Uh, their ability to see from multiple perspectives. Their academic performance is higher on standardized testing. Uh, their ability to pick up a, a third and a fourth language is higher. That seems to play out in all of the research. At Richmond Elementary, students can take after-school classes in martial arts like karate and kendo. They can also practice calligraphy, which gives them another way to learn the language and helps children with different learning styles. English is very difficult for her to write. The fact of the matter is, kanji and hiragana and katakana are not difficult for her to write. And I'm not even sure why this is, except that having those two ways to come at one subject has been a, a big help to her. So learning to write a new language was very, very beneficial in what it will do for your brain structure. It's a very fascinating thing to see how easily children can pick that up. Computers can also help students write in Japanese. These fourth graders use a program that lets them form Japanese characters by typing combinations of English letters. They're composing multimedia self-portraits to share with email pen pals in Japan. Some kids are having a difficulty actually write in Japanese it's because it's complicated language. But since the uh, computers, um, they're used to it at home too. They're playing the games and they love it and then that boosts up the, their interest. So then uh, this really helps developing their literacy skills. Did anybody carve a pumpkin? Yes. In a fifth grade cultural exchange, Japanese students from a school near Tokyo visit Portland. What is the best thing about your home state? I like cheese factory. Cheese factory. If you plant the seed, you will grow into a tree and you will get more persimmon than you can ever eat. The visiting students make presentations in English at the school and stay with families of fifth graders. I'm incredibly happy that I started my children in this program. My middle child, Mason, who's in fifth grade, who we have the homestay student for, he's shy, he doesn't talk much. I wasn't actually sure how much Japanese he knew. When Yuta came, I realized he knew a lot of Japanese. He is speaking to him in Japanese. They forged a friendship in just eight days. Later in the year, Portland fifth graders get to visit Japan. And there's another trip abroad in the eighth grade. Money for the trips and other program needs is raised by an active group of parents who say the benefits of the program are well worth the effort. You don't spend extra time or effort thinking about how you're learning Japanese, and all of a sudden, they know Japanese. And I can't imagine how wonderful that would be to graduate from school with this real skill.
I think if you can take a child at the age of five and throw them into that cultural and language mix and let them know that English is not the only language, that, that America is not the only culture, they develop a really broad tolerance of things that are different. We live in a small world. And I really feel that as it becomes increasingly small, we must learn to not only get along with other nations and other cultures, we need to understand and not think that we are the only kids on the block. For more information on what works in... Right, so staying on the topic of code switching, another word for that is also called contrastive analysis. And code switching or contrastive analysis is called the, is the practice of comparing and contrasting the linguistic structure of two languages. And this strategy facilitates learning and understanding of standard English by increasing a student's awareness of the difference of rules between the language that they bring from home and also the one that they use at school. Constra contrastive analysis or code switching has led researchers to notice that there are three major benefits to using this method. And these three benefits are number one, it increases students to be able to recognize the differences between standard English and the SEL. And number two, students become more proficient editing grammar, vocabulary, and syntax in their work. Number three, students gain a greater facility in the use of standard English in both oral and written expression. And so besides just understanding the CLR method, we need to learn how to practice them in real life situations. And that would lead us to the activities that we could use for code switching. And there are about five different activities that I've listed for helping students with code switching. These activities you would be, um, you would base on the content that you need and also the grade level that you're teaching. So number one is sentence lifting. And sentence list lifting is the use of literate, um, poetry, songs, plays, student sentences, prepared story scripts that incorporate specific contrasts of home and target language rule forms. For example, a teacher would take lyrics from a song, a popular song, and students would change those lyrics and those lines into standard English and then analyze the sound difference and the effect on the audience as well as the grammar structure. So number two, retellings are when students listen to a selection in the target language, and then the students have to retell the story in their own home language. And then the retelling is taped in order to compare and contrast with the language of the contacts. So number three is role playing. And this gives students an opportunity to practice situations through acting and writing in the target language. And students learn situational appropriateness through which language is best suited for the environment, the audience, and the purpose or the function. Number four, teachable moments, a form of contrastive analysis in which the teacher encourages spontaneous verbal responses from the students about the material that was read or presented. And this creates an on-the-spot opportunity for situal, situational appropriateness in the classroom. And then next, number five, is worksheets. And worksheets can be in the form of just exercises or different writing activities where the students are able to analyze language forms. And these worksheets, they help students learn how to gain experience it in analyzing language forms as well as they could interact with each other while doing them. So sentence lifting 
the first one and retellings would be best suited for like reading and language arts and also social studies, while role playing and teachable moments would be best for like mathematics and science and worksheets and role playing exercises would be better for upper elementary and lower grade level students. So sentence lifting, retelling, role playing, and teachable moment activities are all effective in helping students recognize similarities and differences between their home language and that of the school. And when teachers are using a CLR approach and incorporating these methods into their teaching, they need to begin first with validation and number two with affirmation of the student's home language. And this would be best to meet the students' learning needs of the underdeserved children. Once teachers understand the linguistic features of their students' home languages, then they're better equipped to make lesson plans that accommodate these features in the context of standards-based instruction. So I have one last video that goes along with code switching. In this second grade bilingual classroom, the thematic unit that the children are studying is called the Processes of the Earth. And today we're going to see a dictado that was created using thematic concepts around the processes of the earth. ¿Por qué es importante el dictado? ¿Para qué nos sirve el dictado? Ay, gracias por alzar la mano. Gracias, Julián. Siempre hacemos el dictado de las oraciones para que nos aprendamos y que se nos quede en los corazones siempre. Ok. ¿Y para qué más hacemos dictado, Jennifer? Para aprender. Ok. ¿Y quién me puede explicar con oración completa para qué hacemos dictado, Emanuel? Hacemos dictado para que aprendemos nuestros errores. The dictado has three purposes, to teach automaticity in writing, so kids get to write more fluently, and with more fluency in their writing, their thoughts come easier and they become better writers. That's one purpose. The second purpose is that this is a strategy that is being done across all of Central and South America. So we're doing what we call a culturally relevant strategy. The parents know the strategy, they've done it in schools, they can help their kids at home. The teachers using the strategy in the classroom are using something that's familiar to the kids and their parents. Then the third purpose is that we have very limited time in the school day and there's a whole lot to do. So we're not teaching spelling as a separate subject, grammar as a separate subject, conventions as a separate subject. We're teaching them all in an integrated way around meaning. El título es La Erosión. ¿Pueden repetir conmigo? La Erosión. Ahora voy a leer el dictado. Lápiz abajo. La erosión es el desgaste de la tierra. Ahora lo podemos leer juntos. Repiten después de mí. La erosión es el desgaste de la tierra. La erosión es el desgaste de la tierra. The teacher first chooses a dictado, which we like to say is grammatically complex but succinct. No more than three or four sentences. In a second grade classroom, three or four sentences is more than enough. She first reads the dictado to the children. She makes sure that the children understand what the dictado is about. And then she breaks down the dictado into sentences and phrases. Es el desgaste. Es el desgaste. While the teacher is doing the, the first run through with the kids, she's giving them a lots of cues. First word, first sentence, which is a cue for the kids to use a capital letter. 
end of first sentence to keep for the kids to learn a period. Solo vamos a leer juntos. Si ya terminaron, ya terminaron todos. Sí. Okay. Vamos con el título. La erosión. Doy un tiempo por si hay que corregir algo. Veo a Jennifer que está corrigiendo algo. Seguro le faltaba alguna palabra. Muy bien. Once the children have written the dictado, they, they do what's called a talk through. So the teacher recreates the dictado with the children and they engage in something called self-correction. So as she's saying, now did everybody capitalize this first sentence? Even though she cued, that doesn't mean everybody listened. They're going through the dictado this time and correcting the things that she's going to draw their attention to. Ahora empezamos el párrafo. Volvemos a empezar con mayúscula. Si se les olvidó, tres líneas y lo escriben arriba. La dejo un espacio. Erosión. Me acuerdo que las palabras que terminan en ión se le marca acento a la O. Oh, no. Kids like it when they know something. So we see the kids say that through, yes, they got it right. And so they're taking on not just responsibility for their learning, but a sense of pride in that they are smart, they can learn. They can learn, in this case, in two languages. Los nombres propios se escriben con mayúscula. Y la palabra tierra es un nombre propio. Es como decir María, Marta, Río Amazonas, Monte Everest. Entonces, tierra va con mayúscula porque es un nombre propio. Les voy a enseñar, hoy estamos aprendiendo, que van comas en una serie. Tenemos que separar las series con una coma. Y lluvia es parte de la serie. Es un elemento. Lluvia. Por favor, revisen su dictado. Si lo escribieron mal, no olviden cruzar la palabra y escribirla bien arriba. ¿Alguien le pasó eso? Muy bien. Una linecita nomás, no la van a revisar. The meaning and then a very important part of the talk through of the dictado is that children self-correct. So they, if they spell something incorrectly, they cross out the word and they write it correctly above the word. If they didn't capitalize a letter, they do that as a part of the self-correction. Ustedes ya son unos expertos. 
the children doing the dictado, the children, the teacher doing a talk through where the kids are recreating the dictado and self-correcting. Hay erosión por lluvia. Hay erosión por lluvia. Tormentas de hielo. Tormentas de hielo. La erosión es el desgaste de la tierra. Okay, ¿cómo voy a empezar el título? Muy bien. Todos los títulos, ¿qué? Los títulos. Muy bien. ¿Algo especial con la palabra erosión? ¿Quién lo quiere decir? Abril lo va a decir fuerte, oración completa. Abril, alza tu mano. El dictado es meant to be done three days a week. Day two, the kids are saying, we always capitalize the first word of a sentence. Then by day three, the kids are familiar with the dictado. So she's doing more, more fluent, uh, more rapid dictation. She's asking the kids, why do we need a capital letter here? So she's changing the way that she's interacting with the, the children around that. Abril. La erosión um, termina con ese, ese. El sonido. ¿Cuál es el sonido? Sí, sí, sí. ¿Y qué pasa, Abril? ¿Qué es lo especial? El acento en la O. Muy bien. Si así lo tienen, se dan una palmadita. Muy bien. Si a alguien se le olvidó, lo cruza, por favor, y lo escribe arriba. Muy bien, empezamos la primera oración. Empieza con... Mayúscula. Muy bien. Bueno, lluvia. Uy, Catherine, ¿qué quieres compartir? Que le falta acento. No, le falta um, coma. ¿En dónde? Eh, de, de um, antes. De, ¿Antes o después? Después de lluvia. Muy bien. ¿Por qué va coma después de lluvia? ¿Quién lo sabe? Uh, ¿Quién lo sabe, Denis? Ah, porque, porque es una lista. Oh, todos. La lista se separa. Coma. Muy bien. So the big finish is when we notice that the children are doing more of the talking about the teaching points and the teacher doing less that the children are making fewer approximations and that they're able to articulate which approximations they're making and why. Todos ellos, ustedes son geólogos, son científicos, y siempre que tengan que escribir y dar un reporte, ir a trabajar y escribir, tienen que escribir bonito, escribir así como escribieron todos ustedes hoy y van a aplicar la acción, van a aplicar la y, van a aplicar las mayúsculas y el punto final. Un aplauso para todos. Uh -huh. All right. So, after watching just that example of code switching, that just brings us to the end of our chapter. Um, so, just the six main takeaways from this are number one, the CLR approach and methods to non standard languages. Number two, responsive academic teaching to help students move from home language to academic language. Support and skills for students with a secondary or a non standard language. Um, remember the four different linguistic categories and what they are the linguistic absolutes and code switching was most important. So that wraps up chapter six. Thank you everybody.